Good morning. Read with me in the scriptures today. Go ahead and get your copy of the authorized version. Read with me in the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Read with me. Follow along, word for word, verse by verse, of what we will be reading today. I'm sure I'm telling you the truth. I'm sure I'm not lying. In reading today, if you come across something that you don't get quite get the context of it, pause the video. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Pause the video and search the context on your own time. Read along with me, because sometimes my mouth goes quicker than my brain. I got to, I gotta say that to you all the time. Okay? Read with me. Okay? There is always hope. Hope. We're going to be talking about hope today. And no, that's, we're not talking about some other person. But um, hope is who? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father. But we're going to be looking at hope today. There are those out there who say, well, faith and hope are the same thing. <laughs> those are probably the same people that will tell you liberty means charity and charity means liberty. They are not the same thing. The one complements the other, but they are not the same thing. We're not going to be dealing with faith today. We're going to be dealing with hope today. Is it possible to have hope and no faith? Absolutely. Is it possible to have faith and no hope? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to begin in the book of Ruth. Now the word hope itself appears, I think, something like 120 times. We're not going to be looking at all those references. We do not need to. Okay, we do not need to. We're going to begin in the book of Ruth. Chapter 1, verses 1 and verse 13. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now when it comes to this uh, about the book of Ruth, about how the, they went to Moab, um, it is argued, it is surmised that they should have stayed put, that they should have stayed put, some will bring up, up, well, Abraham went to Egypt or something like, or went to Canaan or whatever, and uh, the children of Israel went to Egypt during the, uh, during the famine and whatnot, yada, yada, yada. It is surmised by many that they should have stayed put. There's evidence to su support this um, thought. Let's keep reading. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Nomi. And the name of his two sons, Mahalon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Nomi's husband, died. We have no telling of this man's age. We actually don't know what he died of. Famine involved, there could have been many things, but we know that he died. Okay? And she was left of her two sons. So her husband died, and her two sons are left. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Mahalon and Kilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So right there from verses 1 on to verse 5, you get some kind of an evidence that perhaps they should have stayed put in Bethlehem, Judah. 
Okay? Reasonable argument, reasonable thought. Okay? Let's pick up at verse 6. And she arose with her daughters in law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Even stronger evidence that they should have stayed put, isn't it? Yes. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Nomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I am too old to have an husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they are, were grown? Would ye stay for them? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughter. For it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. You see right there in verse 12 the very first appearance of any kind in the scriptures of the word hope. Hope. Now you look in Webster's hope is a uh, desire to obtain something good with the thought that it might actually happen. Okay, that it's actually obtainable, okay? That's how Webster defines it. But we, we don't need to go to Webster for that, do we? Because look at verse 12. Okay, what was Naomi's hope? Where she says there, okay, if I should say I have hope. Hope in what? That she might obtain a husband that very night, uh, be with child and bear children, hmm? and that they would wait until her sons be grown, so that, okay? Hope that there are a desire for something good, and that it was actually obtainable. Hope, as defined by Webster. But also we see here, also in Scripture. And of course, when you look at verses 19 and 21, on to 19 and 21 here in chapter 1, and of course, Ruth cleaves unto Nomi, okay? 19 unto 21. So the two went on, so they two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Nomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Nomi. Call me Mara, or Mera. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me know me, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Again, the evidence within the book of Ruth that they should have stayed put, and I am one who uh, adheres to that thought, that they should have stayed put in Bethlehem. Okay, I'm, I believe that they should have as well. But you got more evidence that there you should have stayed put. Okay? But hope. Hope. Naomi is saying, what, why should I hope that I should have a husband, bear children, and that they, you two uh, daughters-in-law of mine would wait around till they be grown so that they, you, okay? 
What was her hope? What was her hope in? That she would have a husband and that she would bear children. Okay? Okay? And as far as she was concerned in that respect, okay, that she would have a husband tonight and bear children? Rapido? But look at, let's look at chapter 4 in Ruth, chapter 4. Well, that did not happen, that Nomi had a husband, again, that we know of in Scripture. Ah, excuse me. Okay? And that she bore children. But, the Lord is what? Pitiful, merciful, mm -hmm. and of great compassion. Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 on verse 17. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when, and when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Nomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. And a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter in law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Nomi took the child, and it lay in her bosom, and became her son to her. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Nomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse. The father of David. Hmm. Where Nomi didn't have a husband again. She did not bear her own uh, children. But the Lord gave her the opportunity to be nursed unto Obed. Who is the father of Jesse. Who is the father of David? Hmm. Who came of the lineage of David? You see, go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verses 17 on verse 21. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him, whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth, make alive the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope to obtain something good, a desire to obtain something good, and that that desire to obtain that something that is good, and there is none good but God, that it was actually able to be obtainable. Okay? Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And this is talking about Abraham. Okay? Who was 99 years old, I believe it was, and uh, Sarah was 90. It's like, yeah, he's going to have a son. And lo and behold, Isaac. Lo and behold, Isaac. Okay? And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He was a hundred. Beg your pardon. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And, here's the thing for hope, being fully persuaded that he, what he had promise, promised, he was able also to perform. So hope, desiring something good, and that, it was, that it's actually obtainable. Okay? Okay? And when it comes to faith, okay, we're not, we're not going to be talking about faith today. But when it comes to faith, here's your best definition of what faith is, okay? 
We're, we will touch on this very briefly because we've got a lot of scripture we're going to go through today. Hebrews chapter 11, one verse, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Okay? There's your definition of faith. All right? And when you look in Webster's, he's got a whole bunch of definitions. Okay? But there again, faith is very simply defined in Scripture. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You and I don't see the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have faith in what he has done. The finished work of the cross. The death, burial, and resurrection. The blood shed on the cross that cleanses us, us from all iniquity and sin. Right? Alright? We have faith in the scripture that tells us we are once saved, always saved. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay? We have faith in what is written. We can't see. We can't see the Lord, but we have faith. Because he has exalted his word above his own name. Okay? Faith is very easy to define. Okay? Okay? But now, let's go to Ezra. Ezra. Another look here at hope. All right, Ezra, chapter 10. Ezra, chapter 10. We want verses, if I can get there. One on verse 5. Ezra, chapter 10, verses 1 on to verse 5. Now, when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great com congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. Who were they reading or weeping about? Hold your place and let's look at Ezra 9, verses 1 on to verse 5. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the, of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. And then Ezra, and when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down a stone. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel, because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat a stone until the evening sacrifice. Okay. Let we'll just read on verse four. Excuse me. Okay. That's that's what happened. Let's go back to Ezra chapter ten, picking up at verse two. And Shechaniah the son of Jael, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now is yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. What was the hope? What was the hope? Seeking for something good from the Lord, and that it was actually obtainable. What was that? Mercy and forgiveness for doing what? Mingling themselves among the heathen. And the Lord made it specific that they were not to intermingle with other nations. Why was that? Because the Savior of the world would come from Israel. Okay? That's one of the reasons. Okay? But what was the hope? What was the hope? That mercy would come and that it was obtainable okay verse 3 now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord 
and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites and all Israel, to swear that they would that they should do according to this word. And they swear. So right there, right there, we see a very good definition of what hope is. Okay? In Ruth and in Ezra, especially here in Ezra. Okay? But see, what do we, what are we as saints supposed to have our hope in? Now this is, well, the Lord! Some of us need to be reminded of that, don't we? Sometimes, from time to time, don't we? Hmm? Take your part. Let's go to the Psalms. Let's go to the Psalms. Okay? Psalm 16. We're going to look at quite a few Psalms today. Quite a few. Like I said, we got quite a few scriptures we are going to be going through today. Psalm 16, verses 7 on to verse 11. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Reference unto our Lord Jesus Christ. Thou wilt shew me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And of course, right hand synonymous with the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? And you could also read in its entirety Psalm 22 on your own time. Psalm 31. Psalm 31, 21 on to verse 24. Blessed be the Lord, for he hath shewed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. O love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. We're called to be faithful. But he also <laughs> plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. And as we had seen, in Hebrews 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And as we have seen in Ruth and in Ezra, hope is what? The obtaining of some good thing. And that obtaining that some good thing is actually that there's a chance that it might actually come to pass. And our hope is in who? The Lord. Hmm. And there is none good but who? God. See, Jesus Christ, He is our hope. Okay? In the description box, we have uh, there will be a video for you about that. Okay. Now let's go to Psalm 33, 16, on to verse 22. Verse 16 on to verse 22. And see, we're going here with this especially. We're going to see that the adversary, Satan, will try to 
give you another thing of hope, a false hope. But, verse 16 on verse 22, there is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Ruth, our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in Him, because we have trusted in His holy name. And there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, according as we hope in thee. Psalm 39, Psalm 39, verses 4 on to verse 7. Lord, <laughs> make me to know mine end, and the measure of my days when it is that I may know how frail I am, that you don't trust in yourself. God forbid. Believe. Trust in your heart. You're a fool if you trust in your heart. You're a fool if you trust in your own self. You can do nothing unless you believe in yourself. Mm, no. Behold. Thou hast made my days as an hand breath, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Salah. Surely, every man walketh in a vain shoe. Shakespeare, who dances and st who struts his stuff upon the stage and is heard of no more, it is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's from Macbeth, by the way. <laughs> Surely every man walketh in a vain shoe. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches, and knoweth not who shall gather them. Verse 7. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Psalm 71. Psalm 71. Verses 1 on to verse 15. In thee, Lord, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Who is? Yea, has God said? Deliver me in thy righteousness, and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me, and save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For thou art my hope. O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. 
My praise shall be continually of thee. Again, you, you don't have life today unless the Lord allow you to have life. He is the one who has allowed you to be alive. I am as a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. For mine enemies speak against me. And they that, and they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together, saying, God hath forsaken him. Persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O oh God, be not far from me. O oh my God, make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. But I will hope continually. And will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall shew forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Verses 1 on verse 7. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, shewing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. The father and the mother are the ones that are to teach the children. You don't hand your children off to the Jesuits, okay? To be taught by the enemy. Especially in the things pertaining unto the Lord. God forbid. Verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. And look at what's happened today. Children being brought up today, they have this socialist, kind of communistic kind of thing that their hope is in the government. What is the hope of these children today? Is it in God? in themselves, in the government, or whatever. Anything but God. Hmm. And John 14. John 14. Verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, just one verse. Not James, Brad. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Let's add verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Who is our hope? Timoth uh, Titus, excuse me. Titus 2, 11 on verse 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 
looking for that blessed hope. Some people, you know, the blessed hope, the redemption of the purchased possession. Okay, the redemption of the purchased possession, the catching away. Who is the redemption of the purchased possession? See, well, Brad, it's an event, yes. Okay, yes, you're right. But who is the author of that event? It's weird, because people, it seems, and I've run into this, where people want to separate the redemption from the Lord and look just for the event, not rather the one who causes the event. You see? Okay? And of course, with that, hold your place because we're coming back. Go to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, one verse. Jesus, uh, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And of course, John 14, 5 and 6. Hmm. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Go back to Titus. Verse 13 again. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who is the blessed hope, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. <laughs> and uh, if the Lord has used you at all, at all, in witnessing on the people through the Romans road, as they call it. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 on verse 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Ah, right? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. <laughs> patience. I'm not a doctor. Yeah. And patience, experience, and experience. Oh. And hope maketh not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now see, verses 1 under verse 5 is specifically addressing those who are saved. Because the only way that the Holy Ghost is given is if the Lord saves you and He seals you with Himself. He is the Holy Ghost. Okay? By Romans chapter 5 and witnessing, you're going to know who you're dealing with. Whether someone is going <clears> to <throat> be obstinate or someone is broken. Okay? Hope maketh not ashamed. Who is our hope? Who is our hope? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. We hope in His mercy, we hope in His provision. He is our hope. Everything of us, dear saints, is about Jesus Christ 
God our Father. But see, Satan can have you, well, well, try to, I should say, excuse me. Satan will want to try to take your eyes from off the Lord and have it fixated on your circumstance, as it is with us right now. We are in a dire moment right now, my wife and I. We're not going to make it. But see, the devil will have us look at this, while the Lord will have us, hey, okay, yeah, you might not make it, but you look at me. Never mind this. You look at me. Not that you're to be oblivious of what's around you. No. Or flippant. No. But you keep your eyes upon the Lord. Psalm 60. Let's go back to the psalm. Psalm 60. Psalm 60. And see what happens is we could take our eyes upon off of what we are supposed to and get too fixated on these things around us. Amen? I don't know how some of y'all could drink cold coffee. Psalm 60, just two verses, 11 and 12. Now you got to remember, Satan is all about flesh. All about. He's a fan of man. Even Al Pacino said that. Never mind. Okay? Psalm 60, verses 11 and 12. Give us help from trouble. For vain is the help of man. Now God will use man, yes, to help one another. Saints, helping saints, yes. But if you look to a man in and of himself for help. Like the children of today are, are trained to. Verse 12. Through God we shall do valiantly. For he it is that shall tread down our enemies. And of course, uh, reference again, Psalm 39. Reference again, Psalm 39. Verses 4 and verse 7. Okay. Uh... Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breath, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity, Silla. Surely every man walketh in a vain shoe. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches, and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Okay? So, and Psalm 108. Psalm 108. Verses 12 and 13. Again. Give us help from trouble. For vain is the help of man. To God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Okay, you, okay, hold your place there, and you compare Scripture with Scripture. Okay, Psalm 60, 11 and 12, and Psalm 108, 12 and 13. Hmm. Actually, in Psalm 108, you could add verse 11. Wilt not thou, O God, who hast cast us off, and wilt not thou, O God, go forth with our hosts? Hmm. Interesting. Now, Psalm 118, verses 1 on verse 9. Psalm 118, verses 1 on verse 9. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. 
I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do unto me. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. See, God will use his saints, his body, to help one another. Yes. But see, ultimately our help is from who? The Lord. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man and flesh. It is better to put it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Hmm. The thing about princes, huh? The prince of the power of the air? Against spiritual wickedness in high places, right? And these children today, being taught to trust in themselves, in the government. <laughs> but see, go to now, let's go to Job. Let's go to Job. Let's go to Job. 41. Job 41. See, Satan will have you trust in flesh. Anything but the Lord. And what does Satan do? In Luke chapter 4. All this will I give you. If you fall down and worship me, all will be thine. And it makes you ponder and ask the question. Uh, with some of these Christians who aren't saved. <laughs> but yet they're Christians. It makes you look at them. It's like, who's answering your prayers? Job 41. Verses 1 on to verse 10. Job 41, his scales are his pride, will be in the description box for you where we go the, through this thoroughly. This is a veiled reference to Satan. Job 41. Okay? Job 41, verses 1 on to verse 10. Canest thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put an hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? And remember in Job chapter 1 and 2, Satan goes before the Lord, being the accuser of the brethren. Okay? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy, for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skins, skin with barbed irons? Or his head with fish spears? Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Oh boy. The hope of him is in vain. And see, that's exactly what Satan has done through Christianity, through so many means. Hoping in man. Hoping in a system. And the hope of him is in vain. Satan is a created being. His ultimate end is the lake of fire. As with all those that trust him. The hope that Satan gives you in man, in worldly things, is in vain. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? I love this, verse 10. None is so fierce that there stir him up. <laughs> Who then is able to stand before me? <laughs> and of course, Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. 
verses 1 on to verse 3. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 on to verse 3. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. And that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt. You've got to remember within the Old Testament, for our instruction in righteousness, Egypt is likened onto a type of that. And Pharaoh, that, the world, the world. And Pharaoh, for our instruction in righteousness, is likened unto who? Satan, the little g-god of this world. The prince of the power of the air. Okay? And what do so many people do? That walk to go down into Egypt, the world, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Again, People are looking to the government. People are looking to man rather than the Lord. They got, oh, how many of you Christians today went to your church building? You did, didn't you? Huh? And, and, and the Lord, you know, in uh, Acts chapter 7 through Stephen, uh, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Today, you got to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. God is not the author of confusion. For our instruction in righteousness, therefore shall the strength of Satan be your shame and the trust of the shadow of the world your confusion. For our instruction in righteousness. Okay? Isaiah 31. This one verse. Woe to them. Verse 1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. And stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many. And in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Let's read to verse 3. Yet he also is wise and will bring evil, and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers, and against the help of them that work iniquity. Now the Egyptians, those of the world, are men and not God. And their horses flesh and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth, helpeth shall fall, and he that is hoping shall fall down, and they all shall fail together. Man at his best state is altogether vanity, and Satan favoreth, savoreth the things that be of man, not of God. See, if Satan can get your eyes away and put, have you put your trust in the world and in man, we saints, we know better. We know better. But yet, oh, wretched man that I am, like Paul. You gotta remember Romans seven. You know, if you if y'all would spend time in the scriptures, study to show yourself approved unto God, that ye be a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you read the scriptures, especially about Romans chapter seven. Paul, who didn't want to sin, but he sinned daily and he hated it. Go to Lamentations. Lamentations. There is such a thing where we can hope in vain sometimes. Brad, what are you talking about? 
Lamentations chapter 3, verses 17 on to verse 29. Now Lamentations, the Lamentations of Jeremiah, talking about how the Lord punished Israel, Jerusalem. Punishment for what they had done was not going to go away. The severity of that punishment could have been lessened, I believe, had they submitted to Nebuchadnezzar, but of course they didn't. Of course they didn't. But, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 17 on verse 29. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot, I forget prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance, and is humbled in me. This I recall to mind, therefore I have I hope. See, the punishment was going to happen, but after the end of that punishment, there is still hope within that. See, but see that they were going to escape any kind of judgment. Every one of us is going to give an account of himself to God. Okay? That cannot be escaped. We saints, we're going to give an account of ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ. You don't get to the judgment seat of Christ unless the Lord saves you. Okay? Alright? Within this dispensation. After this dispensation, especially once the redemption of the purchased possession happened, and we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, after that, it's the great white throne. Okay? Verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. While you're, while you're going through whatever it is you're going through, hope in the Lord is better than the hope in anything of this world. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Verse 27. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. Verse 29. He putteth his mouth in the dust. If so be, there may be hope. This is talking about when you're going through um, suffering. When you're going through something, for example, you messed up. You messed up. You've done things you shouldn't have. Like Peter talks about, you know, when you're buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently. Okay? This is what this is referring to. You're taking it patiently, hoping on the Lord that after that chastisement for us saints, it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Okay? It's better to hope in the Lord than to hope in anything else, especially in such a circumstance. And then when you look at Lamentations chapter 4, Lamentations chapter 4, verses 13 on to verse 20, Okay? For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her, they have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. They cried unto them, Depart ye, it is unclean. Depart, depart, touch not. When they fled away and wandered, they said among the heathen, they shall no more sojourn there. 
The anger of the Lord hath divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the persons of the priests. They favored not the elders. As for us, our eyes as yet failed for our vain help in our watchings. We have watched for a nation that could not save us. They looked to Egypt. See, they looked to any everything other than the Lord. And the Lord warned them through Jeremiah. He warned them, hey, turn away from these things. Look, you're going to be punished no matter what. That, that cannot be helped for what you have done. You're going to be punished, but the severity of your punishment can be lessened. Submit to it, and the Lord will be gracious unto you. You're going to give an account of yourself to the Lord. That cannot be escaped from. Okay? That cannot be escaped from. But see, if you come to the Lord on His terms today and He saves you, you're once saved, always saved. Your works for your rewards may be burned up. You might not have any rewards, but you will be with the Lord. Okay? And see, a lot of devils like to play to that to try to convince you that they are saved when they are not. Got to watch out for that, brethren. Okay? Let's continue. As for us, let's read this again. Our eyes as yet failed for our vain help and in our watching. We have watched for a nation that could not save us. They hunt, our set, they hunt our steps, that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled, for our end has come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow, we shall live among the heathen. Lamentations 5, 19 under verse 22. And ultimately we have to remember about the book of Lamentations. They were lamenting what the Lord brought upon them rightly and justly in his anger and his fury towards them for forsaking him. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever thy throne from generation to generation. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. But thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. Job 13, one verse, Job 13, verse 15, just one verse, Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Hmm. Now, their own ways were their own ways in the book of Lamentations, but you got to remember, the whole thing about Job. Okay? Job was one who feared God and eschewed evil. Okay? Saints, when we're going through things, we have to remember that our hope is in the Lord. No matter what. Okay? We have to remember that. But let's look at something... Now, in 2 Samuel, okay, Israel was to be punished for, they, for them forsaking the Lord. In another dispensation, okay, you got to remember that. You got to rightly divide the word of truth, okay? Israel was not going to escape their punishment, but the severity of that punishment could have been lessened. 
Okay? That's what they got for looking to man, for looking to other things but the Lord. Okay? You read about that in the Kings and Chronicles, in the whole book of Jeremiah. Okay? But there is another incident in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 7 on to verse 14. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is after David and Bathsheba. Okay? David and Bathsheba. And David had Uriah the Hittite killed. Okay? He, he gave the, his own death warrant in his hands, and then Uriah took it to Joab, and Joab's like, okay, you go over there by where they are shooting out for the wall, and then they killed Uriah, and then he sent the thing back to David. It's like, Uriah uh, is also dead, okay? But David committed adultery, and Bathsheba was with child by that adultery, okay? And the Lord sends Nathan to David in um, 2 Samuel chapter 12. And Nathan tells the story about the, the rich guy and the poor guy. And the poor guy had one little ewe lamb. And the rich guy had all this to choose from, but he wanted the poor guy's little ewe lamb. Okay? Talking about David going after Bathsheba. Beginning at verse 7. And David, of course, when Nathan was telling them this because of the guilt that David had, knowing that he was guilty, he was indignant. It's like, oh, this guy shall be killed because he hadn't shown any compassion. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. And I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom. And gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore, hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. God still used David. Okay. Brother, our, our brother Alexander um, did a really good uh, video. God still used David. Which will be in the description box for you. Okay. Yes. Lord still used Le uh, David. Yes, he did. What a cost, huh? Like I said, that video will be in the description box. Verse 13. <clears throat> and David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Now, people who have no understanding or anything will come to this as like, that's so cruel of the Lord that this child was going to die. You have to remember some things. David was the king of Israel. Okay? God's representative on earth. Okay? Under, a dis under the dispensation of the law. For this, let's remember for us today, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just one verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Okay? 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. See, the way you serve the Lord reflects the Lord. And how many of you have made a total rear end of yourself before people and even have brought embarrassment upon the Lord as a saint? It happens. It happens. You lose your temper. You do something that you shouldn't in front of people that you know you shouldn't have done. Okay? The way we serve the Lord reflects the Lord. Okay? And Paul reminds us of this in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Okay? All right? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, we all make mistakes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. But you got these easy believism devils saying, Hey, chuck it all off. Don't worry. Live like you want to live. You just believe. Therefore, you're saved, eternally secured, just because you believe. So you, you, you shouldn't do these things. But don't worry if you do. The Lord's honor, the Lord's name means nothing to them. Okay? All right, all right, and and also now Deuteronomy chapter four, verses five under verse eight. Deuteronomy chapter four, okay. Deuteronomy chapter four, verses five under verse eight. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. See, under the law in the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people to be a witness unto the nations of God, okay? As we are today, the body of Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. We just looked at the scripture verses. Okay? Being ambassadors for Christ. Under the law. They were ambassadors for the Lord. Okay? Verse, uh, uh, verse 7. Uh, well, let's read verse 6 again. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Which shall hear... All these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Verse 7. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great, that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? See, Israel under the Old Testament, under the law, was God today. They are the apple of God's eye. That has not changed. But see, they were called out of Egypt to be God's ambassadors unto the nations. Okay? The way you serve the Lord reflects the Lord. Okay? And that crosses dispensational lines. If you haven't figured that one out. Okay? Why do you think the judgment was so severe on Israel in the book of Lamentations? Peter says, if judgment begins at the house of God, okay, judgment must begin at the house of God, okay? If judgment begins with us, 
and the righteous scarcely be saved. What about them who ain't? Do you get it? Do you get it? Okay? All right? And, of course, Le Leviticus chapter 20, just one verse. David as king, according to the law. Leviticus 20, verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. According to the law, David, David deserved to die. So did Bathsheba. So did Bathsheba. We just saw it. We just saw it. We just saw it. But the child, verse 14 in 2 Samuel, chapter 12. Verse 14 in 2 Samuel chapter 12 again. Howbeit by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemy of the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So David and Bathsheba, but David as the anointed of the Lord, messed up royally. He should have died. Verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan, Nathan said unto David, The Lord ha also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Kind of like in the Garden of Eden. They died spiritually, yes. But an animal had to die to, co you know, to cover up. Okay? So, David didn't die. But that child, born of adultery, He died. And people say, well, that's so cruel. No. And you know what? I have this nagging suspicion that this child, which us saints are going to see up there in heaven, um, that child of himself had nothing to do with this. I bet you up there in heaven with the Lord that this specific child has has it made pretty well in heaven wouldn't you think so hmm? wouldn't you think so see when you and I get up into heaven there brethren this very child we're gonna see in heaven wasn't the child's fault it wasn't I bet you there's just a a little bit more special place up there for this exact child. I bet you. Wouldn't you? But now let's read verses 15 and 16. Now, verse 14 specifically. The Lord said through Nathan, Howbeit because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die ipso facto going to happen. There was no changing it. Just like in Lamentations. Okay? Punishment. Severe punishment comes upon Israel. Okay? That was not going to be escaped from. The severity, I believe, could have been lessened. But yet, punishment was going to come. Regardless. Okay. All right. A remnant made it, of course, obviously, yes. Okay. Every one of us is going to give an account of himself to God. Okay. When the Lord saves you today, when you come down to him on his terms, you are once saved, always saved, sealed until the day of redemption. That's not going to change. But see, there are so many other things you can lose. And the devil to dispute once saved, always saved. How can saved people do that? Saved people do! Okay?
but we're all going to give an account of ourselves to God. Save people at the judgment seat of Christ. You don't make it to the judgment seat of Christ. The redemption of the purchased possession, okay? To die, we saints, when we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The redemption of the purchased possession happens, okay? After that, you're going to be at the uh, great white throne, okay? But let's, let's read this. Verses 15 and 16. Now, again, verse 14. Child's going to die. The child's going to die. That, that cannot be changed. Look at what David did. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. Verse 16. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. David was hopeful, wasn't he? Hoping for what? Verses 21 on to verse 23. The child dies. And after the child dies, David washes himself. It's like, come on, let me eat. I'm hungry. Okay? Verses 21 on to verse 23. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread? They're like, dude, what's, what are you doing? And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? Okay? Look at verse 22 and look at verse 14. God said, How be it because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And we looked at Deuteronomy 4 in comparison with us today for 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay? The way you serve the Lord reflects the Lord. Okay? Because of what David did, the Lord, for his name's sake, had to do this. Just like with the severe judgment upon Israel. There was no coming back from that. David was hopeful that the Lord would spare the child. However, that hope that he had Because of verse 14. That hope was vain. Because the judgment was already given. Okay? It's not vain to hope in the Lord. Have you, have you been following along, reading along with me? At what we have already looked at? No. Hope in the Lord is not vain. But the Lord gave specific judgment. And David right here. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? Verse 23. But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? All hope that God would spare the child even when he said he wasn't going to was gone. But here, but still, see, here is hope yet in that judgment. I shall go to him to heaven but he shall not return to me look at that don't look at me look at that verse okay David's hope was that in him fasting he you talk about guilt okay you talk about being sorry for his sin that's what Psalm 51 is about the closest thing you're gonna get to a sinner's prayer never mind the prayer of Manasseh okay that's the closest thing here. There, Psalm 51. Um, be in the description box for you. That's the closest thing you're going to get to a sinner's prayer. Okay? After what he did with Bathsheba. Okay? Alright? He was hoping that the Lord would spare the child. Okay? He couldn't. Yeah, yes he could have. Yes he could have. Yes, of course he could have. But see... 
for his name's sake, for his testimony unto the other nations. Like it says in verse 14, okay? He had to, okay? For his name's sake, all right? Israel, in the book of Lamentation, their judgment was going to be, was so severe, okay? For his name's sake, all right? Okay? But in verse 23, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. I shall go to him. There's the hope. Even in the severity, there's the hope in verse 23. This hope that uh, David hoped that the Lord would spare the child. The Lord wasn't going to do that. But his hope now is, I shall go to him. Okay. This brings us now to a, a, a clear, okay, now talk about something that, um, about this. Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. We look now to Esau. Esau. And our Lord said of Esau, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Esau had hope that he would receive a blessing. But Esau's hope was definitely in vain, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 27. Now, if you don't know the story of Esau, Esau came from the field one day, and he was so faint that he was going to die. He was so hungry. I'm going to die. And then goes to Jacob and is like, hey, give me some of that red pottage. And then Jacob's like, sell me your birthright. Your birthright. And then Esau's like, what good is this birthright to me? I'm going to die of hunger. So he's like, okay, here, give me that red, give me that pottage. And Jacob's like, okay, here, here's pottage. Okay? Esau asked for a bowl of soup. And Jacob not only gave him a bowl of soup, but he also gave him water to drink with it. He got more than he asked for, but he paid a heavy price. That's why God hated Esau, because he despised his birthright. Okay? Then it came time to collect it, as it were. Genesis chapter 27, verses 30 on to verse 34. Okay? And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. And he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn, Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who, where is he that hath taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. Verse 34. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, not Tobit. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 on to verse 17. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, for who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing that went to Jacob, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Book of Hebrews, written for the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble. 
because during the time of Jacob's trouble, the mark of the beast, the only time in Scripture where there is a guarantee, no repentance, when someone takes the mark of the beast in their hand or in their forehead, you're ipso facto, no, no chance. Okay, never mind with John MacArthur, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Breaker, Kim, uh, Hoven, who say you can cut it off or gouge it out. No. Once you take the mark of the beast, you're going to hell. That's it. You're done. It's the only time in scripture that's like that. Okay? That's why it's mentioned in the book of Hebrews. Okay? Because the book of Hebrews is written onto the Hebrews during the time of Jacob's trouble, just like the book of James is. Okay? All right? Okay? We've got to rightly divide the word of truth. All right? And look back in Genesis chapter 27. Let's look at verse 38. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Let's read on to verse 40. Let's look at the secondary blessing of Esau. And then when Esau and Jacob reunite, after uh, Jacob wrestles with God, Esau is happy because of his blessing that he got, his secondary blessing. Esau was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, earthly, sensual, devilish, and the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Yeah. That was the secondary. Um, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. Watered by the dew of heaven, yes. But earthly, sensual, devilish. Whereas Jacob, the difference, see, see, this is why God hated Esau. Because unto Esau, his God was his belly. Okay? His God was his belly. Who minded earthly things. Hence, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. And is not all of Christianity basically based upon earthly things? Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. Verses 27 on to verse 30. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be short. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. Jesus Christ is our hope. But those who look to Satan as their hope and his Christianity. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright. But destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. Proverbs 11, verses 5 on to verse 8. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. Ah. 
Because what is their hope in? Is it in the Lord? No. It is in what? Anything but the Lord. Is your hope truly in the Lord? Or are you seeing the blessing rather than the blessor? The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. The righteous is delivered out of trouble. Ooh! Tying perhaps to delivered out of trouble? Redemption of the purchased possession? Hmm? Trouble? Ooh! Time of Jacob's trouble, perhaps? I'm not saying, I'm just saying, of course. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Oh, was hope deferred for Esau? His heart was sick for a little while, wasn't it? But then, you know, he had the fatness of the earth and he was okay, right? <laughs> Hope deferred, put off, put away. Make the heart sick. Oh, wait, 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 verse 12. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. And see, hope. Hope. Our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. A desire for something that is good and that it is actually obtainable. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. You lost people, you atheists, who, who hope in things of the world. What is your hope? Think worldly things? But when the desire cometh, come up hither for us, the saints. It is a tree of life. And the tree of life you read about in Genesis 2, verse 9, Genesis 3, verses 24, 22 on the verse 24, you look that up on your own time. But the tree of life, okay, Actually, let's look that up ourselves, okay? Genesis, go to the beginning, Genesis. Genesis, the tree of life, okay? Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Just one verse. Uh, verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what Satan tempted. Okay? It's like, yea, hath God said, there were two trees in the garden. We don't have the time to get into that right now. But there were two trees in that garden. Hmm. And then you go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 on to verse 24. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Hmm. Proverbs, go back to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. This, we're just touching on this, about this thing about the tree of life. And of course, these wicked heretics like to take this out of context and whatnot, but Proverbs 3, verses 13 on to verse 20. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, fear of the Lord. 
and the man that getteth understanding departing from evil. Man in and of himself cannot truly judge what is truly good and what is truly evil. We need the Lord and his word to do that. Look at what's going on nowadays. I rest my case. Okay? Look at what is being called good and what is being called evil today with the woke nonsense. Okay? For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She, the fear of the Lord, is compared again to a beautiful woman. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness. And all her paths are peace. Fear of the Lord. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And happy is every one that retaineth her. Note the verse 18 about the tree of life. Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, right? And in Job 28, 28. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Fear of the Lord is what? Eternal life. Get it? She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And happy is everyone that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop down the dew. Look at that. Wisdom and understanding, the fear of the Lord, and departing from evil. Knowledge. There are two wisdoms. There is a wisdom, two wisdoms, okay? Writing that down for a link in the description box. The wisdom of the Lord, which is the fear of him. And there is this wisdom of the world, which is what? Earthly, sensual, devilish. Okay? Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11. Verses 30 on to verse 31. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth much more the wicked and the sinner. Talking about, of course, um, inheritance in the kingdom of heaven and that kind of stuff. Okay? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And you have your fruit unto righteousness, which is what? Everlasting life. Okay? More on that in a second. Proverbs 15, verses 3 under verse 9. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. The perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A wholesome tongue speaking the truth of God's word. Rightly divided. Okay? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Corrupt. Okay? Speaking contrary to the word of God, okay? Speaking contrary to the word of God that is pertinent for the dispensation that we are in, okay? Yes, that also includes profanity, yes. Yes, it does, okay? Let's continue. A wholesome tongue is a, is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A fool despiseth his father's instruction. He that regardeth reproof is prudent. What are we reading to on verse 9? Okay. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked of the wicked is trouble. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, which is the fear of the Lord. Okay? But the heart of the foolish doeth not so. He who trusts in his heart is a fool. 
and the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But he loveth him that followeth after, oh, after righteousness. Excuse me. We, uh, we skipped verse 8, didn't we? Sorry. Let's read verse 7 and 8. Excuse me. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. But he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Look at verse 7. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge. But the heart of the foolish doeth not so. Okay. Look at verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. 1 Peter chapter 3, one verse. 1 Peter chapter 3, one verse. Verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and godly, with meekness and fear. Excuse me. Let's read verse 16. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Notice in verse 15, and we've talked about this before, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It doesn't say that you are to answer every question. What's the reason of your hope? And see, that's what we saints give to people. And see, infiltrators and fakes whose hope is in fleshly things, they can't rightly answer that, can they? Oh, they can get close. But see, someone whose truly hope is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Romans chapter 8. You were wondering when we would get to that, weren't you? Romans chapter 8. This is 19 on to verse 25. For the earnest, earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Who is our hope? Jesus Christ. And devils, infiltrators, they can put on a facade, they can get close to that hope, but sooner or later, their hope is in worldly things that their father, the devil, gives them. And sooner or later, they shoot themselves in the foot every time. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. Yes, we saints, we want to get out of here and be with the Lord. But the lost, they want us to get out of here so that they can enjoy the treasures from their father, the devil. Like, uh, like made reference in one of the videos, someone, a friend of my wife, saw a bumper sticker, you know, uh, waiting for the rapture to happen, and once the rapture happens, the world will be ours. Think about that. Okay? Satan wants the redemption of the purchased possession to happen. So, 
the world will be his for a little while. Okay? Remember that. See? <laughs> Think about it. Both want the redemption of the purchased possession to happen. We saints, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay? But see, we're still here. So that must mean that there is a purpose for us to be here. I am one who believes if there wasn't a purpose for us to be here, we wouldn't be here. What's the point? There's obviously some point. Or else, I'm old-fashioned. If there wasn't a point for us to be here, we wouldn't be here, right? Satan and all his ministers of righteousness, they want, will these guys get out of here so we can rule the world? See, the, the devils, they want us gone so they can establish that kingdom of Antichrist. So yes, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and prevaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, capital S, the Lord Himself. And the Lord is that Spirit, that seal until the day of redemption. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. <laughs> There's the redemption right there, verse 23. Waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. Who is our hope? The Lord Jesus Christ. The blessed hope. The redemption of the purchased possession. He is the resurrection and the life. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And see, the devils, the infiltrators, their hope is that all this will be theirs. And you know what? It will be for a little while. It will be. Get out of the way first. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with ah, patience wait for it. And hope maketh not a shame. So, you know, the trying of our faith, like it says in Romans 5, worketh patience, and with patience experience, and with experience hope. I will confess unto ye, brothers and sisters of the church of the living God, saints, God is faithful. And um, we're not going to make it this month. But we still have hope. We still have hope. And hope make it not a shame. The world is going to fail you. Man is going to fail you. But God will never fail you. Trust in the Lord, who is our, who is our hope, who is our shield. Jesus Christ is our hope. Brethren, you and I, saints, Jesus Christ is our hope. Let us never forget. As times get rougher and rougher and rougher, Jesus Christ, He is our hope. I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we will trust in His mercy. That's going to be it for, that, for this video. 
Thank you so much for watching this if you do. There are a lot of brethren right now who are struggling and suffering. Pray for those brethren. There's a dear brother of mine who is um, struggling with his flesh. A dear, dear brother who needs all the prayers he can get. A sister. We all, all of us, every single one of us, of the church, of the living God, all of us saints, Every single one of us, unless you're one of these perfect creatures, we're all going through something. Whatever it is, pray for one another. Find out, inquire, how can we pray for you? And pray for them. Pray for one another. Because prayer is the most, one of the most effective weapons that we have. Along with the sword of the spirit going to be it for this video. going to get this one uploaded. Thank you for your prayers. We love you. We'll see you in the next video.